Phil and I just published our very first scientific paper. It is a pretty big deal. You may have seen it on the news. You may have seen it, uh, quite frankly, you probably saw it anywhere you turned on the news lately. It has to do with a very small white, literally white, great white shark that we filmed. And uh, we're gonna take some time to talk about it today and just discuss with you some of the significant findings that we observed and uh, just share it with you. So here we go. So before you go forwards, if you haven't read the paper, it's in the link below in the description of the video. So stop the video, click that link, read this paper because we're gonna go through it and we're gonna discuss some of the relevant facts that are in this paper on why we think this is a newborn shark. Now, Phil is a graduate student, a PhD candidate at UC Riverside, and he often consults with me on a lot of the uh, footage that I capture. And uh, let's talk about it a little bit. Absolutely. So this paper, it, it took what, six months to get it published? Yeah, uh, from once we made the observation in July, once we saw it, and then we wrote the manuscript quickly, put it together, and then it was only recently accepted in early January. So it's been quite the road to get this one published. Okay, so for our paper, we have two hypotheses for what we observed. One is that it is indeed a newborn white shark, and we presented some supporting evidence why we believe it is a newborn white shark. The other is that it is a skin condition. Yes, a skin condition. So we give two scenarios and we want the scientific community to evaluate both scenarios with their own expertise and their own judgment and also for the public to evaluate themselves because the peer review process was very good for us in this case saying, okay, well, what if it isn't a newborn? What's the alternative scenario? I'm like, excellent. And we want to present that to the public and the scientific community. And that's how we came up with the skin condition. I personally believe it is a newborn shark because of one specific key point, and that is the dorsal fin. Now, this is an area that Phil is an expert in. He, he biomechanics is your field, yes, right? Yes, So tell us a little bit about why the dorsal fin is so vital here. Yes, so what's great is one of my projects, or I should say one of my dissertation chapters has actually been on what we call shark allometry. So how does the shark change as it grows larger? How do the shape of its body or certain body parts change? So of course the fins are the go-to. So what we've seen in white sharks, especially young white sharks, their dorsal fin, their pectoral fins and caudal fin all look a certain way very young and very you know, new to the world in this case, just freshly born, you know, what we call neonates, compared to adults, which have very differently shaped fins, I might say, more pointed, a lot longer. So that's your giveaway. And I've seen this before in other shark species, how those fin shapes will change across what we call ontogeny. As the shark gets older, it gets bigger, those fin shapes will actually change. And looking at the dorsal fin even more, I'm gonna zoom in up yeah. here. The key component here is that it's, it's so round. It's so rounded, yeah. So the giveaway that we see in a lot of what we call embryonic white sharks that have been obtained from pregnant females that have unfortunately died, or neonates as we like to call them, that are freshly born, we see that those fins are very rounded, so short and rounded. And this white shark that we saw on that day happens to have a very short, rounded dorsal fin. We went back all the way to 1996 where there was a fishing vessel that mm -hmm. pulled in the pregnant white shark, had babies inside of it, and photographed the deceased babies. Now we were able to compare those sharks to our shark and they look very eerily the same, like mm -hmm. almost, this, especially the dorsal fin, identical, yes. right? Now imagine if those folks were rejected and did not publish that paper where we would be today, right? Yes. So this is another reason why this paper was so important to be published for us because yep. we just wanted a scientific record of it. Yep. Now, this is something that you'll probably agree with. We are not 100% saying this is a newborn white shark. But we are saying that the probability is the highest at this point given the data we've been mm -hmm. we presented that it is a newborn white shark. Yes. Exactly. So Again, we use the word hypotheses or hypothetical in both of our scenarios. So we said the first hypothetical scenario, it's a newborn white shark. The alternative hypothetical scenario, it's a skin condition. So we use the word hypotheses. We are not speaking in absolute saying, yes, it definitively is this or that. We're giving hypothetical scenarios and again, letting the scientific community evaluate it for themselves. We definitely plan to go try to find another one this year. Yes, right? exactly. That's the key point is now we've you know, produce this piece, this scenario, and if we find subsequent findings of this observation that can corroborate what we've seen, 
then you have support and you're building off this. So you need to have this in the record to establish a baseline and for others to see if they can replicate this, you know, the findings. And like, oh, we found a newborn shark, or we found a shark with this white film on it. It seems that it does support, you know, one of these hypotheses. In this case, we think it's a newborn shark, but exactly. So you want to have a baseline or something in the published record. And one of the things that uh, people ask us is how did we find this shark? How, how did it occur? This, I, I'll be the first one to tell you, this was not a one-off lucky thing. There is an element of luck to be in the right place, mm -hmm. yes. But since 2020, in the, in the fall of 2020s, when I first started noticing in a specific location, very large sharks gathering within a two to three week, almost a month long period in the summer, then they would be gone. I'd never see them again. Mm -hmm. So that's one, two, three years in a row of observing <laughs> this. This was the fourth year. Mm -hmm. We happened to be there. Mm -hmm. And as a nature cinematographer, you, you get a hunch. There's mm -hmm. something going on here. And that's what we did. That day, Phil and I went out there. We were literally on our second to last battery when this happened. It was luck in a sense that we, we had enough batteries <laughs> that day. I think we flew like 20. I, I think your words are just like, whoa, what is this? You know, looking on the little viewfinder and I, I get behind you and then we both just see this white, I mean, it's a white shark, but it's legitimately white. And I, I don't know who said it first was albino or just like, what is this? So I remember it vividly when you see any animal that just solid white like that, the first thing that pops in your head is, it's an albino, mm -hmm. it's an albino. And I think that's what we both said, yep. probably simultaneously. simultaneously this is been, an yep. albino white shark. Yep. And it wasn't until I flew that final battery that I'm there using the last bit of battery to just review the footage on location that we noticed one of the most <sighs> important <laughs> sequences for this whole thing. So. First we're saying, oh, it's, it's an albino shark. But then on that last battery run that we had, we actually noticed that the shark itself wasn't white, but there was a white film covering membrane on the shark. And not only that, as the shark was swimming, it was literally, it, we'll say it this way, shedding off the shark. It was coming off the shark as it was swimming. I was just completely blown away by this. I could not believe it. That, that, that moment, of, of when we notice the shedding coming off, we're gonna use the word shedding for, for layman's terms mm -hmm. here, but it, as the shark was swimming, you could see the stuff coming right off of it. We had no idea what this I, was. It, it just didn't look like any other shark we had seen that day. I was just like, the fins, the, the, the overall morphology, as we like to say, the shark just did not look like those typical white sharks we've been seeing, the larger ones. I'm like, okay, this is definitely something different. And this white film, that's something unique. And it's, I'm like, I've never seen it. I doubt anyone else has seen anything like this. So we, we might have just found something extraordinarily rare. And it's a huge scientific, scientific discovery. Really, I was just blown away. Again, <laughs> blown away is the word I'd use. Now, that shedding part, that, that slothing is what they wanted Sloth, us? Yep, slothing. That, that's the word they wanted us to use yep. in, in the publication. That is nothing like, I've never seen no. anything like that. No. And I've viewed many, many little bitty sharks. Yep. They're called young of the year, meaning they were born within the last year. Yep. Uh, but that is usually, that was the fuel for the skin condition, right? Yes. Yeah. So again, and to the reviewers points, they're like, okay, maybe this shark just has a rare skin condition that again, hasn't been documented before, which again is significant in its own right. I, I wish to reiterate this to everybody. It's, it's significant in its own right that no one else has seen this. So what does this mean for the future? You know, we're gonna plan an expedition this year where we're gonna, we're going to look for another one this yes. year. Uh, there's, I believe, only a three week time frame yep. when this is gonna happen yep. again. Yep. And uh, the, the other part of this is what does that mean for the protection yep. of some of these areas yep. in the future? We've included yep. that in the paper. Yep. Uh, and what does this mean for future research when it comes to baby sharks? Yeah, I mean, the big thing that you and I both strongly agreed on putting in this paper is the conservation aspect, because as you have documented several times, is we'll find sharks or you'll see them. And then I, I was there that day we saw it, the shark that had a leader coming out of its mouth. So fishermen will catch them and they'll cut the line, but that doesn't necessarily mean the white shark gets away unscathed, as we like to say. So he still had the leader and he was getting scraped up. And sometimes if that leader can get caught on something or just stresses the animal out, it could cause it to die later on. What we've said the whole time 
is that we believe we have captured a piece of a clue to the holy grail of great white shark science. Mm -hmm. And that is the exact birthing place. Where do they give birth? Yep. We believe we've captured a clue to it. Yes. And if we can pinpoint where these big, large females are aggregating yep. in those two weeks, yep. that might be the holy grail. Yeah. And this may seem uh, very, very basic, but where white sharks give birth is more of a thing about near shore or offshore. It's yep. not necessarily a GPS coordinates <laughs> because white sharks are found all over the world. Right. But if we know that they give birth in 60 feet of water as opposed to a thousand feet of water, yep. it's a huge thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one way of thinking about this, and this has been my interpretation, even before we got on this project, if a shark is born offshore and then we find them near shore, on these coastal habitats, that would mean that the shark would have to swim all the way from offshore back to inshore, and then they're going against possibly other predators, other large sharks, because large white sharks will eat smaller white sharks. They do show cannibalistic behavior. So it's just the rationale to me is to be born offshore in a dangerous territory doesn't seem like a, a, a good life history strategy. So being born near shore, once they're in this nice coastal habitat where we see a lot of the young of the year white sharks, it only makes sense that they should be born there. So it would help resolve the scientific debate that's been going on for a while now. And that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. we, we are not here to debate. We're just here to provide data. Prove us wrong, prove us right, but the data is there mm -hmm. for future scientists and hopefully even you, somebody, young kid out there in the future can use this in the future and maybe cite our paper like yes. we did yeah. the 1996 and, and the 1985 papers yep. that were on record. Perfect. Yes, exactly. Yes. I, I encourage, I mean, I started my shark passion once I was five or six years old. So, I mean, I, I have a shark shirt on today. It's still going just as strong over 20 years later. So you can live the dream. I came from the Midwest. I'm now on the coastline here studying sharks. So it's all achievable for everybody. If it's a passion, I say go for it. Definitely. Go out there, become a marine biologist, study sharks. I fully, fully am all on board. Any young person who wants to go in that route, send me an email, send me a message on my website, and I can connect you with Phil. I can connect you with people that will help you. Uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to speak to the school system up in San Jose here next month. Perfect. Uh, and, and just kind of do a little tour, speaking to uh, young individuals who have never, some of some who have never even been to the beach and try to get the information like this to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Outreach is one of the greatest things that we strive for in the scientific community is, okay, because amongst ourselves, we'll talk about papers, but engaging with the public, to under, you know, let them know, okay, why is this significant? Why should we care about this? And that's a big thing that science is really trying to get on, especially now, you know, 2024 and the last couple of years is scientific outreach and exactly doing that and engaging with the public who doesn't always has have access to this material or even know about this material, it's an important thing. So it's great to do. And I benefited from, from YouTube itself because mm -hmm. I'm not a marine biologist. My master's degree is, like, is in a completely different field, but I have a passion for this field. Yes. And I didn't know that passion until I was older, and especially when I started flying drones, but <laughs> it really, really is uh, valuable to get the information we're trying to present to you out there. Mm -hmm without twisting it, with just presenting the, the photos, you can decide for yourself. Yep. Scientists are really good about reading their own papers, conversing amongst each other. Yep. But the, the, the awesome thing that we have here is that we can converse directly with you mm -hmm. and show you a little bit of the natural world that we all kind of take for granted sometimes. Yeah. Right. I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you do just take it for granted. You're like, oh, okay, it's another day here and this, but there's exciting stuff going on out there. And it's just great to, you know, again, someone coming from the landlocked Midwest and now seeing this and having this opportunity and then other people can now see this because of the videos that you obtain or, you know, pictures and all that. It's just great to share this knowledge with others. And before we sign off here, I do want to tell you that point, I don't know if you can see it behind me back there, that is Point Doom here in Malibu, California. That is the spot where I was standing when I first saw my very first great white shark. Yeah. I was standing up there. There was a predation attempt on a sea lion. I could see it from up, the, up on that rock. And it's that day that I decided 
you know what, maybe I should look for sharks. And now we're here, <laughs> and we have a full year of expeditions uh, going now. I'm going to try to bring you some more shark information and content. Yes, absolutely. I'm all for it. I'm on the ride. I'm with you, so let's go <laughs> out there and do it. And Phil, hopefully we'll have his PhD by next summer. Yep. Hopefully. Yep. So you're going to be hearing a lot more from Phil. Hopefully we can uh, travel to some pretty cool places and bring you some more science. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Good job, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. That's good. That's the way it should be done.